Angel is brought to you by Audible with an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at audible.com slash angelbook. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Angel, my new podcast. My guest today on Angel is Andrea Zurich. She's a former Googler. In fact, she was one of the first 100 employees at Google where she handled a lot of sales and marketing efforts. And she took all of that experience and her network in Silicon Valley amongst Googlers and others and has put it to work investing in startup companies. She's got her own techniques for investing, and we'll hear about her techniques and her process in the first half of the show. In the second half of the show, she's very candid about her losses, things that were frustrating, as well as the big wins in her portfolio. So a lot of honest and insightful Uh, Remarks from Andrea Zurich. Please enjoy. Hey, everybody. One of the things we wanted to do was to have you hear from other angel investors or early stage venture capitalists about how they approach the topics we discuss in this book. This will give you a flavor of not just my opinion, but other people's opinion because early stage investing is a very opaque and mysterious, almost like alchemy. People have not really talked about how they do it, uh, and it's becoming professionalized. Early stage investing has become something that now thousands of people are doing, not just dozens. And in fact, the reason we wrote the book and the reason we were so excited to have you read it was because we think there's a real opportunity here for more people to participate in the startup uh, and technology revolution. So today, I am super excited to have Andrea Zurich here on the program. She is uh, formally of Google, yes. and you run and you found, co-founded a group called XG Ventures. Yes. What does XG stand for? Yeah. Well, first of all, super excited to be here. So thank yes. you so much for the invite. It's yeah. been great knowing you all these years right. and seeing amazing things, by the way. Right. Well, we've both uh, invested in a lot of companies. Yeah. I've done 150, and I think you've done... I've yeah. done almost 100. 100, yeah, right. And we both hovering. started about the same time. Yeah, roughly. Which is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so what is the XG and XG Ventures? Yeah, sure. So um, as one can imagine, as you sort of already alluded to this, so um, I used to work at Google back in the day. Mm -hmm. I know now a lot of people can say that they used to work at Google. But um, authentically, I worked at Google when it truly was um, a true startup. And so I joined early uh, February of 2000. 2000? Yeah. So you were in the first 100 employees? 200? Sub 100. Sub 100. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Long before they were public. Oh, definitely. Long before. <laughs> right. I think uh, actually even before we really knew what our monetization strategy was. It was just a search engine. Yes. And largely the search engine was syndicated to Yahoo. That was the first Correct. big deal you had. Yes. Yeah. And we also had a few other licensing deals with like Acme and right. you know some of the older uh, tech search type firms. Did you know it was going to be big? Did you have a sense when you were there as one of the first hundred employees that this was going to be as big as it's gotten? Yeah. You know, I I felt special vibes, I guess. You know, my spidey sense was going off a little bit, but I don't think I could have ever imagined the scale and, you know, the opportunity, I guess, in front of Google at the time. I just was super impressed with the founders, which we can talk a little bit about. Sure. You know, as we, as we move Sergei. forward, yeah, Larry and Sergey, and then also, um, you know, I I just was fascinated with the fact that you know grew out of sort of like this lab at Stanford. Um, I love their scrappiness. I love the fact that they were very budget conscious. You know, mm. that they weren't, you know, because when I joined in two thousand, we had sort of seen like the boom and the bust of the tech industry. Right. So I like the fact that they were a little bit more conservative, but they still wanted to take some calculated risks. Everything was about research and mm. you know running um, analytics on the back end, and they. Made Made very calculated decisions. Um, so let's talk about how you got into angel investing, early stage investing. Yeah. How did you decide you wanted to start investing in companies? Because you had worked at a big company yeah. or a company that got very large. I would assume that you would get many job offers to yeah. go on the next rocket ship, Facebook, Uber, yeah. whatever came next, Amazon. Yeah. Well, Amazon was before it. But even, you could go to any company. You would have your choice. Mm-hmm. But you decided, I don't want to work inside a company. I want to invest in the next series of companies. How did you come to that decision? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess I never fully answered your question to begin with. Yeah. So so the, the G in XG is really an homage to Google if someone, if a listener hasn't already figured 
that out. But um, ex Googlers, ex Googlers, yeah. yeah. And so it's myself and one other business partner um, that started. We both worked at Google, by the way, for the Got record. It. So we had some working history there. Um, but as you mentioned, you know. Um, Google, fantastic company, still amazing, obviously. Um, but I had sort of, um, I guess, t- I can't really say tapped out, but I felt like my contributions there might have been tapping out for what I had envisioned for myself going forward. Hmm. And I really enjoyed, um, you know, working at the startup. I liked the startup feel, hmm. and I had worked my way through Google, built a sales organization um, at Google. That was one of my main contributions and brought in some large brand name deals. And I loved it. I loved my clients. I loved the experience at Google, but I was sort of looking for that next high, almost that next rush. And working at Google definitely gave me a rush. Every day I came to the office, I felt a rush. Every time I was out talking to clients, I felt a rush. I felt like, to your point, using the term rocket ship, it really was a rocket ship. And we didn't know that at first. We ran into a lot of um, challenges and some opposition along the way. But um, it was exciting, you know? Well, rockets do blow up. Yeah, they do. Of course. They do. do. Yeah, that's true. Not all of them make it to escape velocity and get to orbit. (laughs) But I guess it's addicting. And so is sales. You know, right. I sort of had the best of both worlds because sales is a lot about, a, you know, risk and reward and and everything that goes along with the sales process. But also, you know, pairing that with Google. I mean, it was tons of, tons of excitement everywhere. Right. And being something bigger, uh, being part of something bigger than than what you are, I thought right. was pretty cool. Yeah. And, you know, making a difference in the world and, and um, solving hard, hard problems. So um, I guess coming full circle then, you know, Google had become a little bit more enterprise yeah. and it had grown because remember when I joined, it was definitely sub 100. And when I left, it was probably around maybe 40,000 employees or so. Wow. So it had become a different company as, as it needed to because right. it was public and, you know, there were more fiduciary well, responsibilities. And the opportunity and, became a truly yeah. global company. Yeah. But at the time, I, you know, kind of had to take a little bit of like my own personal inventory and I was thinking, shoot, what do I want to do next? I mean, I could join, to your point, like a Facebook, which still would have been amazing at the time that I left sure. Google. It was uh, 2007, so still you would, would have been, been getting a, on a rocket ship with Sean yeah, Sandberg. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I, I certainly could have considered that at the time, but I had sort of dipped my toe into angel investing already. Mm-hmm. I'd done a few deals, and um, I purposely took it slow because I didn't want to. I mean, I guess I could have written some big fat check, right. but I, you know, it was still kind of new to me. And so I was kind of sampling what I wanted to do testing and take, the waters. testing the waters. Yep. And, but at any rate, I don't know if it was beginner's luck or I don't know if it was, you know, who knows, it could have been timing. It could have been the right company, those types of different things. But um, my first investment actually returned me 10 X. Wow. So <laughs> now, so, so I got the bug, you got the bug for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. And you're already having this great revelation, which I actually talk about in the book over and over again, is even yeah. if you were to lose your money, angel investing, you get to hang out with the smartest, most exciting yes. people in the world. Yep. And it does feel like we're at a massive advantage here in Silicon Valley because there's so many smart people mm-hmm. that investing here in this place at this moment in time, it feels like you have a real leg up versus other geographic locations or maybe during other periods in time. Right. What were your original check sizes and how did you source your deal flow? Yeah. So, um, well, it's kind of interesting now, now that I sort of sit back and think about it. So my original deal, I actually found the way I find my current deals. It was through my personal network. Ah. Yeah, and it actually came through someone that I worked with at Google, and he had a really good friend, and he, he himself had invested in that person's company, and that company had done well. So it was one of those things where, and I guess one of the things that I liked at Google is that you know, it was kind of an open environment. You could chat with your colleagues and it was very flat mm. and I liked that. So I had a lot of friends in engineering, a lot of friends in uh, product. And so one of my friends in engineering brought me this deal and he had sort of vetted it already from a technical perspective. Right. And so I trusted him and I felt like it was sort of a known source. And I, you know, I'm not technical by nature. My background is sales, which is mm. important. We can talk about later. Um, but uh, at any rate, I felt like they were trying to solve a pretty big problem. And so, you know, I put in, at the time, probably a little aggressive, but mm. I put in $50,000. Right. Um, I guess if I, you know, I don't regret that because obviously it was 10X. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I guess I probably could have started a little bit more slowly with like a $10,000 check or something like that. Yeah. But I felt pretty bullish. And so that was my first check size that I wrote. And it's interesting that you mentioned, hey, your superpower is sales. Yeah. When mm-hmm. you are angel investing, and I talk about this in the book a bit, 
usually you're bringing something to the table, not just money. And in your case, mm -hmm. knowing both how Google matured and knowing sales, that's something that is real tangible va value to a founder beyond your money. Do you find that the founders who you work with want your money first and your network and knowledge second, or are these things all equal? Mm -hmm. What did the founders tell you when you invest, that they want your money or they want your knowledge or your network? Yeah. Well, I think it would definitely be a wrong move if an uh, entrepreneur approached you just saying that they want your money, because right. honestly, they could get your money anywhere. You sure. know, they say whatever that old saying is, like all money is green kind right. of thing. Um, so I think they would be uh, doing themselves a disservice if yeah. that's what they place well, as important. That, but what do you think they're <laughs> but, really um, coming for? Do, you, do they really tap you for the sales expertise? Yeah, I, I think it's a network? combination of everything. Yeah. I mean, now, of course, 10 years into this, we've built quite a portfolio. So there's a wow. lot of um, networking, I suppose, and synergy within our own portfolio. So, um, you know, Company A might be interested in Company B in our portfolio, and maybe there's a way that they could leverage that relationship. Ah, so they might become a beta tester of so, their product. Correct. Yeah. Got it. So we've gotten lucky in that sense. Um, almost, well, not really lucky, but we sort of designed it by that uh, in those terms. But um, I think I think it's a combination of uh, you know they come to us because of our background. I think uh, super super lucky, fortunate. We worked hard to work for Google, mm. and that has a lot of brand cachet. Sure. Um, we also cut our teeth at Google at a time when it was hard, you know, not by any means that it's easy nowadays, but it was so much harder to make a difference in the market, right. you know, 14 years ago. Right. Um, and so I think they come to us because, you know, we're seasoned professionals. We've seen the nitty gritty. We helped big build Google from the bottom to the top. Right. Um, we got our hands dirty. You know, we just didn't come in as like uh, Bain, you know, executives sure. or <laughs> yeah, Boston Consulting Group executives. Right. You know, I've we, written a lot of reports. No, we've, yeah. built, we've built a real yeah, company we here. We built it. Yeah. yeah. You know, we put in blood, sweat and tears. And I think they really appreciate that. And they think they value it. Um, and, and again, too, you know, we're not the most technical, but we certainly know enough to be dangerous and to understand it. But I think, you know, when it comes to building an organization beyond those initial hires, which typically are engineering, um, you know, they need to build out what, what the business organization is going to look like. And that's when they need, you know, f um, finance expertise, uh, sales expertise, building it out an organization. Is it going to be flat? Is it going to be hierarchical? Um, you know, what's the culture? You know, Google uh. obviously built... Uh, very impressive culture, and a lot of companies have emulated it. Right. And I think they're, I think entrepreneurs are um, curious to find out. Well, maybe how, what lessons could they learn from the culture that we built at Google, and what could they use maybe in their companies um, to build a sustainable culture. Culture. So now you're sourcing deals from your network. People know because of your mm -hmm. website and your presence. You do some speaking gigs now and again. Mm -hmm. People know who you are. They know that you have yeah. the Google pedigree. They know that you can help with sales and you have your portfolio out there. I'm sure some of your portfolio yep. founders will send you founders they know. How do you look at terms for a deal? We know how mm -hmm. you source them through the network. We know the value you provide. But how do you have the negotiation with a founder about terms? Mm -hmm. And what terms do you think are important for people who are new to angel investing yeah. and early stage investing? Well, I guess first I should be really clear in saying that we do early seed stage. Right. So we're not going to necessarily lead like a series A or a series B or series C, et cetera. Sure. Um, so usually we're part of a syndicate. Um, but, you know, the flavor of the day apparently, um, <laughs> which is good for many different reasons we, sh we can talk about, is we see a lot of safe notes that are generated. Right. Um, and those uh, rose out of popularity from some of the large accelerator groups. Y Combinator, like, yeah. Yeah, Y Combinator or um, 500 startups. Um, so those are easy because it gets the, the deal done quickly. Um, sometimes the safe notes are written uh, to convert to equity. So those are always kind of cool if you do like series seed, mm -hmm. um, which and is And they'll cool, convert at a specific time a at specific a specific time. valuation. Yeah, exactly. How do you value companies so early mm -hmm. when there might not be product market fit or a lot of revenue or traction yet, how do you have that discussion with the founder if they haven't set a valuation yet or mm -hmm. they're telling you, what do you think we should set the valuation at? How, what's standard here in the Valley and, and how do you yeah. negotiate that or do you negotiate it? Gosh, well, in 10 years, we've seen a lot, yeah. <laughs> you know, Go so ahead, it kind of goes up and down. I mean, remember when I first started investing, I mean, it was a little bit of a recession still. So the valuations were that much lower. 
What range? Uh, I think they're around maybe three or four million dollars for those early stage companies, two or three people stage. under yeah. a year old. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then of course they shot up, like maybe two or three years ago, they mm. shot up to you know seven million all the way up to. We saw a couple that were uh, valuating themselves at twenty million dollars in the seed stage. In the seed stage, this was the height of the market this when Uber market. and Airbnb yes. were raising billions of dollars. Instacart mm -hmm. was raising billions of dollars and. They, it sort of dragged up the seed market as well. Yes. Where is, is it now in 2017? Uh, so in 2017, things have sort of brought themselves down a little bit, which yeah. I think is better because it's very dangerous. If you evaluate your company $20 million at the gate, you kind of set the bar really high for yourself yeah. for the next What's the Series stage. A going to be? Yeah, what's the Series A going to be? Is it going to be sustainable? And if you don't hit those... Um, those mile markers, I guess, of those milestones, then you might have to have a down round and no one wants that. Um, so, but nowadays we see things float anywhere between, I don't know, probably 5 million is like the median range, um, but it goes, you know, anywhere a little bit lower than that up to maybe, yeah, it seems you know, like five. Four to six yeah. is, is the new normal. Yeah, four to it's six. It's not quite the, the three or four million range during the down market. Yes. And we're certainly not in that eight to $15 million madness that yes. was uh, a moment in time. Thank God, because we actually have some in our portfolio um, that have had to have been written down oh. um, for down rounds. So that's not a good thing. <laughs> Explain to people who don't know what a down round is, yeah. how that goes down, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, both literally and figuratively. How yeah. does a down round occur and why is it so problematic? Well, it's problematic for a lot of different reasons. Number one, it, f signaling. Oh. It could be problematic for sig signaling, especially when you're getting ready to raise your next round. Mm. <laughs> and if you're not successful, it raises a bunch of different flags. Right. Um, and sometimes down rounds happen for lots of different reasons, whether they haven't met their uh, revenue goals, you know, they haven't brought in the right amount of sales, or, or, or perhaps they don't have, you know... Um, based on user growth, maybe user growth has mm. slowed um, or they just haven't projected user growth correctly. So they raised that $12 million or yes. something, let's say. It was the height of the market or $10 yep. million. So, and now they go out to raise more money and the market says They, they no. say no, yeah. So or they the, question, like, what have you done and why have you not met mm. these uh, goals? Right. So then they have to write it down because essentially the company's not valued uh, where they thought they were originally. So nobody will invest at that level. The founder has to have a talk with the existing investors and yes. say, we can't clear market. Correct, yeah. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, mm. but it is a little bit of a haircut, mm. you know, that companies take, investors take, um, and even founders take. Founders so it, set themselves up for a little bit of a challenge. So if it goes from 12 million, let's say, down to six, the, the new yep. normal, mm -hmm. what happens to the existing investors? And then what happens to the management team? And then how do they communicate yeah. that to the existing investors? Mm -hmm. It seems like a very hard discussion to have. Yeah. You invested at 12 million. The company, 18 months later, mm -hmm. after we spent your money, is now uh -huh. worth half. Well, yeah, that's exactly it. So then we got to rewrite our books a little bit. Right. You know, and so our numbers are affected. Right. Um, so they just call you up and say, hey, w we can't get it done. Yeah. We're going to raise at this level. You're going to be diluted. Yes. It's not, well, it's not that easy either. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's lots of warm up conversations that happen in, in between all that too. Right. I mean, it's not pleasant if it comes out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, the good entrepreneurs will give you a heads up and a warning. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the folks that you do want to work with because not everyone's going to be a unicorn right out of the gate. They right. might have some challenges, but there's a few companies in our portfolio that um, might have tweaked things a little bit, even with a down round. And then it was, it was actually in those instances, a good thing because then they pivoted. Ah. And then they figured out, okay, business model A is not working, but because the, piz the pivot, business model B is actually that much better. Right. And with that pivot, guess what? You know, user growth went up or revenue sales went, right. went up. And then they're in a much stronger position when they're ready to raise that next round. How do you decide if you're going to follow on in a situation like that? And how do you assess deals where they're raising another round of funding and you're deciding if you want to go pro rata, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you... Uh, like I always have pro yeah, rata and yeah. you will not do deals without pro rata. Am I correct? correct? Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, because we see that as an opportunity to double down and make uh, more money on our winners, which yes. is essential. Uh -huh. How do you decide if you're going to go pro rata or if you're going to stand pat or it's even do a, a down round? 
yeah. Down rounds are tough. I mean, we really have to see progress with that potential pivot, mm -hmm. you know, um, before we decide to double down in that instance. Right. Um, but usually we just kind of, it's a hard pill to swallow and we just have to swallow it and move on. Um, for pro rata though, it's a different- And pass when you say And pass, yeah. yeah, and pass. In that instance, we just hold tight. It's sort of like, you know, you're at the table at Vegas and, yeah. you know, you just got- your money in. Yeah, exactly. You're like, yeah. you know what, it's, it's been a good run, but I think I'm going to- Walk I'm just away with my walk hat. Away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Time to call it a night. It's time to call it a night. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think, you know, just going back to your pro rata, I mean, yeah, that's definitely when you when you do want to double down. And sometimes we can't get enough of our pro rata. We'll say we'll take pro rata plus, you know, if there's anything extra, let us know, you know. Um, and those are always kind of kind of good things. Um, let's talk about selection. You yeah. meet with, I'm sure couple of dozen companies to pick mm -hmm. one. Is that about yeah. right? And what's the ratio, do you think, of companies you meet with in person or talk to on the phone and then yeah. wind up making an investment? Gosh, it's really hard. I mean, we have a formalized deal review every Tuesday. So we mm -hmm. look at what's in our pipeline. Uh, but it comes from lots of different things, whether or not we're going to a bunch of different demo days, you Got know, it. standard deal flow, all that kind of stuff. But um, I haven't really counted lately. But I guess if you were to add up, maybe we look at a 1,000 deals a year or something like that, 1,000 plus. Right. And out of a thousand plus, um, you know, we're active in the sense that we like to do about ten to twelve deals a year. One a month. So about one a month. So it's one in a hundred or so. Correct. Now, um, that's still pretty healthy, I think, considering that we're still maintaining our pro rata mm -hmm. um, in the hundred plus companies we already have. Right. So the number of follow on investments you're doing probably equals every year or exceeds the number of new investments at this point in Correct. year six or seven of doing this. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So we always have to keep a little bit in reserve. So we're not sure. going to get crazy and say, oh, we think this is going to be a great year. Let's do 20 investments. Right. You know, and it's not like we're capping ourselves, but that just seems to be what history has dictated as far as our um, yeah. being able to stay in this business as long as we've stayed in it. Talk about the selection of a company. There mm -hmm. seems to be many different philosophies of how yeah. to do early stage investment. I've seen people say, I'm just betting on the founder. I've seen mm -hmm. people say, I look at the product and I just bet on the product. Other people say the market. And then finally, there's another group of people that says, I just look at who the existing investors are, what yeah. the social proof is. And if Cyan Bannister or Andrea mm -hmm. Zurich or mm -hmm. Jason Calganis or Tim Ferriss is investing or Chris Saka, I'll invest mm -hmm. alongside them. And I just pick based on who, I just follow on with yeah. the great investors. How do you do it, Andrea? Gosh, I wish I could just say it was one variable, but it really isn't. So you're, you, you like know? to look at multiple variables. We do, yeah. yeah. Take me through some of them. What yeah. is an average conversation like when you're looking at a startup? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, well, it's kind of a little bit of everything. I mean, obviously the founders make a difference. Mm. Um, in-person yeah. in person meetings are always the best, but if we can't do in-person, we'll do Skype or, or what have you, or Google Hangouts. But I think we look for... Um, you know, tenacity. I think we look for um, the ability to be hungry. You know, um, I think we look for forward looking uh, type vision. You know, has this particular entrepreneur or I guess what I should say is like founder or co-founder. Sometimes we meet with two co-founders. Ah. Yeah. Um, what we don't like to see is a single founder. That's mm. tough. Why? Um, that's for a lot of different reasons, you know, um, what if the single founder has failing health or, you sure. know, they have personal um, challenges that they're going through, et cetera. Um, so basically, if something happens to them, then the business is definitely jeopardized. So if you have one or two, if you have two redundancy. or three, yeah, um, yeah, founders, then there's some redundancy. So I guess that goes back to like, you know, uh, the background of the founders. Um, how many are there? What, what's their background? Have they been proven before? Are they first-time entrepreneurs? Are they re repeat entrepreneurs? Right. Um, what's their pedigree in the sense of, you know, have they also come out of Google or did they graduate from Stanford or yep. were they ex Facebook engineers or what have you? Um, not that we're exclusive to that, but it's certainly helpful because it shows that they passed a certain list, litmus test of working right. for these very well-known um, competitive companies. Right. So they have to have some level of skill to have attained yes. the Stanford degree or having gone to Harvard and quit like you know, Zuckerberg yeah. Yeah, and, totally. <laughs> and also uh, Bill Gates. Yep. Um, uh, so, so that's, uh, you know, like founders, you know, um, their background, their expertise is very good. I think also if they've thought through their business model, um, that's also impressive. I mean, it's not always about the first dollar that's brought in. You know, a lot of times you, um, w you know, will look at success of a company based on how many users they attain and how rapidly, you know, they can uh, grow their, their uh, user base. Mm. Um, so those are, but I, I guess what I look for is like, 
like, have they thought through this? Have they thought through what the potential business model could be? Where's their next um, set of revenue or where's their next, um, where's their revenue going to come from? How are they going to grow the business? Um, potentially, who could acquire them? Ah. You know, that's also important too. Right. So, who is this? If, if they succeed, yes. who would want to own this? So, if you're looking at something like Slack, yeah. which has been in the news at the taping of this, uh, it's potentially being acquired for a large number by yes, Amazon. Yeah. You could look at a Amazon's company. Amazon's on a tear. <laughs> Amazon's on a tear at the taping of that's this. True. They also yeah. bought Whole Foods. Um, <laughs> But it does seem like some businesses, yeah. if they do wind up working, there are so many natural acquirers for them. Slack is Correct. just such a cornerstone of enterprise computing now yeah. and of, and um, people's identity that, mm -hmm. gosh, there's, there's an unlimited number of people who could use that yeah. asset. Uh, what about the market? I hear some people say, hey, I like to invest in markets, not mm -hmm. just people. Um, I, I think the market's more important mm -hmm. than people. What do you think? People or market? Do you look at the market and say, I need to know the total addressable market? I don't know. I or do you think, think that's so. overblown? I think it's overblown because you can make those numbers up, you know? I mean, certainly you don't want it to be such a niche market that no one's going to use the product or it's right. going to be, co you know, because at the end of the day, you know, we're in the business of obviously helping companies and being part of something that's pretty cool and exciting, but we're also in the business to make money. Mm -hmm. And so you want a healthy return on your investment. Um, so to be clear, we're not really giving, we're not in the business of giving out loans. Right. <laughs> it is sort of a loan in the sense that we're helping you grow your business, um, right. you know, through helping you raise capital, but it's not just a loan like you'd get from your rich uncle. Right. You know? They're not just trying to get their money back plus 10%. Yeah. So we're really looking for something that's a breakout success. You want to get to that 10 or yes. 20 or 50x because uh -huh. it makes up for a lot of misses. Correct. And then yeah. you bank actual significant returns uh -huh. over time. Yeah. So I guess in answer to your market question, you know, you want the market to be at least healthy enough to support a type of exit like that yeah. versus in super niche um, industry. All right. Well, this has been super, super enlight uh, enlightening. I appreciate okay. your time. And when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit about Andrea's portfolio and go through some of the big hits, some of the misses, and then some of the ones in between, what we call yeah. the old aqua hires when we get back. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Let me take a moment to tell you about my favorite service. Yes, my favorite app on my iPhone is Audible. I made a commitment in 2017 that I would do three books a month, 36 books in the year, not a book a week. That felt a little too ambitious for me, but I've been going for walks every day, trying to hit my 10,000 steps so I'm healthy, and then I'm trying to be smarter and more worldly and more cultured, and that's where Audible comes in. And Audible has a number of great features that you're going to love. Obviously, it's the largest collection of audio content, spoken word content on the planet. It is amazing, the depth uh, and the breadth of this collection, but... There are some other key features you should know about. One of them is you can change the speed of the audiobook. Now, most people don't even know this exists, but it's a feature I love because some people speak very slowly and other ones speak very fast. And depending on the content, you may want to go a little faster. And depending on the uh, narrator, you may want to go a little faster or even just a little slower. And that really uh, helps my enjoyment of the book. And, and sometimes it's just annoying if somebody's really going slow. Uh, you can do clips. You can do chapter navigation. You can take notes. I love taking notes in it because I might be on a hike. I don't have my pen and paper with me. I want to take a note. Something I've listened to is actionable. Something I'm going to bring to my startup. Something I'm going to bring to my life. I want to write it down. Boom, you just click it in the notes and it's saved forever. Send this book is great. You can send a book to a friend or family member and they get it for free if it's the first time they're using that feature. WhisperSync, an incredible feature. You're in your Kindle uh, and you're in the Kindle app and you listen to the audiobook and it syncs between the two. So if you want to read for a little bit and then you're driving, it knows where you left off so you can have this great efficiency. Also, I was in my Kindle today looking at my book, Angel, and... It was showing me every word I spoke. So when I was in the, um, the, the audiobook reading for my book, Angel, I had to get every word correct so that whisper sync would sync it perfectly. So it took me a little bit of extra time, I'll be honest. It was hard to do as a, an artist speaking a book, but it was worth it for that whisper sync. Uh, and you own your books forever. And I've now started listening to books like Good to Great a second time. 
because they're so good and you get that, this little refresh, right, um, for your mind and for your business. So go ahead. Here's a great uh, offer for our audience. Audible.com slash angel book. Audible.com slash angel book. And you will get a free audio book, 30-day trial membership. And you can download my book of the week. I'm going to give you two books. It's a pairing by the same author. There's a Charles Duhigg did a book called The Power of Habit. And it's really good. It's basically how to get that habit loop started so you can be a more disciplined person, right? Self-help, it's one of the big categories. And then he did a follow-up, uh, Smarter, Faster, Better. And it was just two books that will change the way you think about your own personal habits and building teams. I very much enjoyed both of these books, and I'm going to uh, interview the author. I could give you a bunch of other books, including My Own Angel or Ender's Game or The Hobbit, which I'm listening to with my seven-year-old, or Option B, Sheryl Sandberg's new book. Homo Deus is the one I'm reading right now, which is the follow-up to Sapiens, which was another great book. There's so many great books. I'm like literally flipping through, and you can see I just have so many great books in here. I mean, it just goes on forever. And what I love to do is sometimes I take a flight. I'm worried I'm going to run out of juice on my phone or whatever. I download them all to my iPad. Now I got my iPad, my earbuds in, I'm doing work, I'm, I'm listening to an audio book, feels great. Okay, so I could, I could tell you a million different ways uh, why Audible's great, but you know it's great, and you know you wanna just go in there right now, audible.com slash angelbook, and get that 30-day trial membership. Download my book of the week, uh, as we said, the Charles Duhigg Collection, Smarter, Faster, Better, and The Power of Habit, two amazing books audible.com slash angel book. Thanks again to my friends at Audible. Okay, I'm sitting here with Andrea Zurich of XG Ventures, X Google Ventures, X Googler, and she's invested in 100 companies. Yeah. There are some intangible things you, people look for in founders. What are some of your intangibles that you think about when working with a founder or not working with a founder? Are there pet peeves or just things that you go, wow, that's something that really attracts me to working with a founder? Yeah, it's it's a lot of different things. I, I'm envisioning this one founder that came in, actually, um, it's a consumer uh, app that's mm. selling um, artist-based um, uh, products. So for example, if you wanted to create a t-shirt that had uh, smiley face emoticons on it, huh. um, he's developed a way to create these t-shirts very quickly and simply. Um, but when we first met him, he literally was wearing all of his product. Right. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. So that's a little bit of an intangible in the sense that he was actually representing his brand. He was repping his brand. <laughs> right. Super passionate. Super passionate. Yeah. Right. So we liked that. So passionate quality and some other intangibles that we were talking about before is, um, you know, like the mismanagement part of it. You know, um, will the entrepreneur be respectful of your time? Mm. Because, um, you know, that particular entrepreneur might think that they're the only person that we're looking at for their particular company, but we've got a hundred thousand of these things in our yeah. pipeline. So how do you stand out? Right. So I think it's being respectful of knowing um, what our investment philosophy and thesis is. So when we get an email that's sent to us, you can tell right away if it's either like a form letter, uh, you know, send grid blast, right. or if it's uh, personalized to our firm and to either my partner or myself. If it's they've nice done to know that they've done research. some research. Maybe watched an interview with you or read yes. your blog or checked your social media and mm -hmm. they understand that they're a fit for you. Correct, and yeah. And they're contacting you at the right time. Yes, yep. And also respectful of our time, you know, so not saying, for example, I'm going to be in San Francisco tomorrow. Can I meet with you for 15 minutes? I mean, I appreciate the aggressiveness, right. but I'm also a very busy person and right. so I can't really... It's a little bit weird. It's a little bit weird, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, I started to get text messages a lot now because yeah. I guess I message you can guess people's emails yeah. <laughs> and I get this hey Jason and it's kind of a weird approach yeah. so tell me Andrea when you get to that phase when you're negotiating a deal do you ever get red flags where people maybe over negotiate or just suspect behavior where they're changing terms or just mm -hmm. not smooth in terms of dealing with the founder Yes. Um, the exact names of these particular companies are escaping me, which is maybe good. That's good. But, um, yes. <laughs> but I distinctly remember what happened to us. So um, we had expressed interest in, say, Company X. Right. Acme and, Ventures. Uh, Acme Company. Oh, Ac Acme Ventures. Yeah. yeah Acme. And um, it was presented to us. Uh, and, and sometimes the aggressiveness of presenting a deal is warranted. You know, there it could be um, an oversubscribed deal. It's a hot deal. 
It's a hot deal. Yeah. yeah. And in those instances, you got to move quickly. And I appreciate the aggressiveness and everything else. But what I don't like is if a deal is positioned as being hot and it mm. really isn't. Ah. So in other words, we've been told by the founder, oh, yeah, sure. You know, I'm raising a million dollars. I'm oversubscribed at 1.5. And then we commit and then we say, okay, here's our check for X. And then all of a sudden, the closing of the deal takes a long time. Mm, red flag now. It's definitely a red flag. And so um, in those instances, as time has moved on, of course, we've gotten wiser. You know, if we sniff something out that things right. are going to close, we'll say, okay, we will soft circle X amount of dollars for you, right. but we won't fully commit until you show us, you know, that who the round is really in? is closing and yeah. who's coming in. Right. And that's been another red flag where people might overcommit. And I'm just throwing out these names, for example, but, you know, they'll say, oh, Sequoia is in, or right. Kleiner Perkins is in, or right. Chris Saka is in. Or, and you, you know, call Chris Saka or Sequoia yeah. and you say, hey, what do you think of the deal? And they're like, we and haven't met with these people. Them. Never yeah. heard of them. Never heard of them. So that's a huge red flag. I've been on like, the other side of that where people say, Jason Calagan is committed. Yeah. And I had a meeting and I said, um, let's keep the conversation going, but it was nowhere near committing. And that is a, just a horrendous red flag. Oh, it's a huge red flag. And yeah. so that's really ticked us off in a lot of instances. And then a lot of times we'll just say, you know what, not for us. And not then we'll just us. completely walk away. Yeah. And that's easy to do as you get further on in your angel investing yeah. career and you realize, hey, mm -hmm. you know, early stage investors are investing in a basket and they don't mm -hmm. have to hit every company. Yeah. There is no rush. You're going to do this for five years. You don't mm -hmm. have to hit everyone. There's no yeah. need to panic that you'll miss a deal. Yeah, that's a very good point. Because sometimes, sometimes people have that, whatever it's called, fear of missing out, the FOMO. FOMO. Yeah. <laughs> FOMO. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, you got to... You got to be able to step away, and, it, and you see that a lot with the um, with the demo days. And I love going to demo days. I'm all about my demo days. But sometimes you can get um, you know sucked up into the the feeding frenzy right. of some of these companies. They're constructed to be a feeding frenzy, yeah. where they're telling you which closing. Yep. And I actually had a company send me the term sheet with a hundred thousand dollars in a DocuSign. Wow. Yeah. Because I had clicked on the button that said, you know, I'm interested oh, or I enjoyed like the presentation hand, or whatever in the, yeah. you know, in the interface where you go to demo day. And they're like, well, we took the liberty of sending it. We heard you say on this podcast that you typically do 100K. And yeah. so we, we just wanted to, you know, uh, close this up as quick as possible. It's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, talk to my assistant. We can, I can meet probably in two or three weeks. Like the round will be closed. And I said, okay. Yeah. Then you just. You know what happened? Yeah. They were in my office three weeks later. They hadn't closed their round. See, I just, I, I don't, I mean, it's a fine line, right? Between being aggressive and being right. assertive, which is what you need to do. Sure. To get um, an investor's attention. But then you also have to be respectful too. Right. And there's like a level of BS, I think. You know, yeah. like if I'm, if I'm one of the top, whatever number of angel investors in the world, and you're trying to use high pressure tactics mm -hmm. on me, it just, it shows that you don't respect that I, I'm a considered person Correct. in my mind. I don't know how you feel about yeah. it. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. But I think you have to understand who you're, who you're pitching. I mean, if you're pitching Sequoia, they're going to have their own process. And these are the people who did Google and they yeah. did Apple and Cisco. Mm -hmm. Like, you got to be respectful of the process. Yeah. Exactly. All right, let's talk a little bit about your portfolio. Sure. Let's talk about some of the big hits that you've had or things that have worked out very well for you. Um, Tell me about two or three companies that have done well and that you're super happy about your investment. Yeah. In. Now, when you say do well, are you talking about an exit or still continue to do well? Yeah. So I would say it could either be an exit or it could be marked up or that's growing nicely, right? So obviously, I don't want you to reveal any confidential information, yeah. but obviously, you invested in the first stages. So we can go on Crunchbase and probably see that they've raised two or three rounds of funding. That's a right. good sign that you're on the road to a nice exit, right? Mm -hmm. If they get that Series B or Series C. Yeah. So have you had some of those in the last five years? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, these are still active companies. Sure. But, um, Tell me. So... Uh, uh, we invested in a company called Keen.io. Sure. And uh, they've grown, and they are an example uh, like that, where they've gone from Series A to S Series B. I'd have to double check because I have sure. 100 companies. <laughs> yeah. They've but, done a couple of rounds. But they've def follow definitely done a couple of rounds, yeah. Um, so that's one example. Um, and then uh, eShares is another oh, example. Oh, wow. That's done well. I passed on eShares, and it's killed me. They yeah. launched at my event. Oh. At the launch <laughs> festival back in the day, but yeah. that company's done well. How so did well. you know with each of those companies? Take me through the first couple of meetings and tell me what your thinking was of why, what was your thesis mm -hmm. of why these would be good? Was it the founder? Was it the market? Was it the product? Take me yeah. to each one. Well, I guess just to stay on the uh, eShares vein of things, um, we saw it as solving a big problem. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when we first started doing research into the deal, we realized that, that there had been other competitors out there that had actually failed. Ah. So um, understandably, I could see how some people maybe passed on the deal, um, but we absolutely loved the founder. Um, I thought he was super passionate and cool and just seemed to get it. He seemed right. to 
um, already have a vision of how he was going to build this company. Um, and so um, there's a little bit of that tenacity that we talked about. Right. And I guess that's what attracted us. Plus, from a, a user perspective, um, for anyone that isn't familiar with eShares, it's basically a platform that anyone in the venture space um, can use in the sense of managing their deals. Right. So um, it's a platform where you can track um, all of your um uh, deals from like a paperwork perspective. So for example, if you invest in a company at a seed stage and then they raise a second round like series A or series B, electronically it will do all the math for you right. and it'll show you how um, your share price might have increased with the new round right. of financing. And what your dilution is, and what your entire cap is. table. Yeah, and so essentially it's an electronic cap table. Right. Um, it's a, it's a platform that you can access all these deals. So it's right. great from an investor standpoint and from... Um, from I guess uh, the attorney standpoint, it's great because it's a it's a cheaper, faster, more efficient way of processing all the paperwork that goes right. along with the legal perspective yeah. of uh, of investing. And then, of course, for the entrepreneur entrepreneur and the company, yeah. the 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 startup company, it's a great way of um, sending out like four hundred nine a forms and mm. I guess all of the legalese type documents that you need. But right. anyways, long story short, we felt like eShares was solving a very big problem that was going to affect a lot of people. Right. So we thought, you know, and One it was also a SaaS thing. model. Sorry to interrupt. I yeah, no, no, excited. SaaS model is great, right? <laughs> SaaS, Software as yeah. a service, you know that there's yep. going to be reoccurring revenue, so the lights are going to stay on. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to people buying some software off the shelf one time. Right. You got their credit cards. Yeah. But one thing that was interesting that you mentioned was with eShares, hey, you found a lot of roadkill. A lot of companies had yeah. failed. Yeah. But that didn't dissuade you. If a bunch of people failed at it, wouldn't you say, oh, this is impossible. Nobody can figure it out. Well, How do you look at previous companies failing? I think, well, luckily, it's not over with yet, right? right. But eShares has made a lot of inroads in the marketplace. Sure. Um, but I guess we felt like maybe maybe this could be the one. Ah, you know, the other ones fail, but maybe this will be the one that it, sticks. That's typically how it happens. You had uh -huh. MySpace, Friendster, Zero Degrees, Spoke, a bunch of social networks had yeah. started long before Facebook Tribe mm -hmm. from Mark Pincus. Yep. There were five and six degrees before that. So there, yeah. Facebook must have been the 10th social network of note that was venture backed. Right. Google was the 11th mm -hmm. search engine, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you had yeah. many before it. So, People failing before sometimes is actually a good sign. They've made progress on the idea. They've tried, mm -hmm. but nobody's actually cracked the right. formula. Yeah, exactly. Take me through um, some companies that maybe sold early or had a, let's call it um, aqua hire, where they were mm -hmm. hired for, you know, maybe you got 50 cents on the dollar back or a dollar mm -hmm. on the dollar back, but it felt like an exit too soon and was disappointing. Because as an investor, a lot yeah. of times we'll have a company get bought and yeah. people on the outside think that that's success, but we only doubled our money or yeah. tripled our money or got our money back, and we just wish they had kept going. Do you yeah, have some of those in I the did. portfolio where you're just like, yeah. oh, I wish this company was still independent and still operating? I know. It's hard. Well, one comes to mind only because it was an exit for us this year. Mm. We're pleased. Uh, I guess for the record, I wish it was a little bit higher, <laughs> but that's just me. you yeah. know. Um, but anyways, the name of the company is called Apiary, apiary.io, and um, it was purchased by Oracle. Fantastic. Which seems is, fantastic. Yeah, seems fantastic. And, and it was. I mean, it's definitely, um, I don't know how much I should disclose. I mean, it wasn't like a, a 10x deal for us right. by any means. So a single or a double. It was a single or a double. Right. Yeah, which is good. Because sometimes, you know, you can build a very nice portfolio with a lot of yeah, singles and they doubles. add up. Yeah, but I think, um, I guess selfishly, I was hoping that they would have been able to, to go a little bit further because yeah. the API market is quite hot. I mean, we right. saw it with Twilio, sure. with lots of these different companies that are taking advantage of the ability to implement APIs into an existing solution. And so what Apiary had built was like an API marketplace. Mm. And I think that's why Oracle is interested in them. Yeah, But um, it was surprising because I thought, gosh, Oracle's such a... Um, gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like an established player, right. you know? And I... They might, they might be doing amazing things, you know, but right. they're more um, sort of like the older standby of companies like the yeah. Cisco's and the Oracle's and sure. I guess I was sort of um, thinking you know some maybe I, a Google I, yeah, maybe or a Facebook maybe, exactly yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe they could just really grow this into an IPO type business yeah. and as an angel investor or early stage seed fund you don't really have much control do you no the founder gets to decide unfortunately yeah and for him he actually saw it as a great culture fit 
Right. Um, and that's good because you want the entrepreneur to be very happy. You want them to have a great soft landing for their company. Right. You want their employees to feel happy and supported and, um, you know, a, a good cultural fit. Why do you want that? I, I mean, as an investor, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Why yeah. do you even care? Why would you care? Because I, they, you I got suppose, your money back. Yeah, I suppose to be hard and fast about sure. it, you know, you probably care less. You know, right. it's just the bottom line. But, but you do care. I can but see I do that. Care. And I do care. So yeah. sincerely, why? Is it just being a human you care or is there some yeah. other reason? I don't. I don't know. I think it's uh, maybe just being a human. I yeah. think I think it just it's sort of what got us into this business that, you know, ultimately because right, I could have joined a venture capital firm and right. then I would have been all about the money and all about sure. the bottom line and rightfully so because they have a set of limited partners that they have to report to. Right, and they are in the business of making hardcore money. Right. <laughs> that is their business. Maximizing returns is essential if you want to raise another fund. Right. And um, that's just the nature of the beast. That yeah. is that industry. Um, for us, we have a little bit more flexibility because we are angel investors and we're independent. And we consider ourselves to sort of have like an evergreen fund. Right. You know, our fund is as large as our pocketbooks are right. large. And um, But there's also some altruism in there sure. that um, it's like good karma. Right. You know? Well, and that founder may refer somebody to you yeah. in the future. Or, as I've seen in my portfolio, I don't know if you've seen this now that you're in year six, seven, or eight, mm -hmm. um, you probably have founders coming back to you for a second or third time. And you, I don't know if you've invested like I have, yeah. but I have three or four founders now I've invested in their second companies after yeah. aqua hires or singles and doubles. Yep. Have you had that happen yet? Absolutely. And that is just, um, I guess, I mean, I don't have children, but it's sort of like, you know, when your kids succeed and they come back and they say, sure. thanks mom, thanks They come Dad. back for Thanksgiving or yeah, Christmas or Hanukkah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, It's kind of a nice feel good moment where you're right. like, oh, okay, cool. They had such a great experience. Now they want to come back or they want to refer people. Yeah. You know, that sort of warms your heart and you think, okay, you know, Know, I must be doing something right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, t take me to the most frustrating investment you've had that made you want to pull your hair out and bang your head against the wall that you would never do again, but you can anonymize the names and just yeah. talk in generalities of, oh my God, I'm just, I made a mistake here. I shouldn't have done this deal because we all have them. Yeah, I know. I am going to mask uh, the name of the company. Please because, mask it. Yeah. Yes. The entrepreneur I love, to this day, I love him. I think he made a valiant effort, but it was mm -hmm. a tough industry. And essentially uh, the industry, at least for us didn't work and it's the travel industry hard industry it's very lots hard. of incumbents mm -hmm. is that why it failed the incumbents or I was it just so yeah. yeah i think it was just kind of a tough road and mm. it was crowded and mm. you know we took a chance yeah. you know um but he just couldn't execute uh, ah that's tough yeah. So. so you're watching the founder try to execute in a difficult market, yep. and he's just not building a good enough product, not hiring a good enough team. Yes, correct. Not yep. doing good enough growth tactics. Everything is just an poorly executed. Yes. What do you do in that situation? It's sort of like if you invested in a restaurant and they yeah. just can't make a good steak. What do you do if you're the investor and you're watching and you go to the restaurant and the food's not good? You know, it's kind of one of those tough conversations you have to have, mm. and I really value and tip my hat to the entrepreneurs that I guess are man enough or woman enough to realize that and um, don't get sort of pigheaded with the idea of like, I'm just going to run this company into the ground until I have zero dollars left in the bank. Right. This particular entrepreneur realized his company was failing mm. and uh, he tried very, very hard to get a, it. It actually was acquired, but it was acquired for almost cents on the dollar kind right. of thing. But um, at least he uh, was able to return a little bit of capital to the mm. investors. And so that actually, I mean, it was a big it was probably, I mean, I'm not even kidding you. Like at the end of the day, we probably got a check a for like $30 or something. But, but it just sort of showed that he cared. And it right. was like, you know what? Uh, people believed in me, for example. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking like for the entrepreneur. Right. Like, you know, you guys, XG Ventures, cared enough to uh, believe in me. So I'm going to believe in you guys and at least try and return whatever I can. See, I think how people behave in failure yeah. speaks even more than in success. Because in success, uh -huh. everybody made money. Everybody can pop champagne corks. Exactly. And if there was some behavior on the edges that wasn't a, you know, exactly where you wanted it to be, yeah. it's kind of forgotten in the yeah. victory parade. Yeah. But in failure, I, I've literally had two companies now where they had aqua hire possibilities yeah. and they literally said, you know what, I really don't want to work for that company and um, it's yeah. below market rate and, you know, the only way we're going to get a return for our investors is if we spend a year over that company, which I'm not willing to do. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, wow, you will never be funded again, at least not by this cohort of investors. Correct. If you couldn't be bothered to at least try to get us 50 cents or 75 cents on the dollar yeah. because you didn't want to 
put the year in. Yeah, I know. Yeah, is that amazing? Yeah. I mean, it feels, and it, in both cases, it felt like very, you know, I thought this would be like something to expect from a millennial. In both cases, yeah. it was not millennials. It was Generation <laughs> X people. That I was like, really? Yeah. Like, don't you think you're going to have like another startup company? And I, and I think in their cases, yeah. they just did not care. Wow. Yeah, you <laughs> run into those people that are just, yeah. yeah. But then I think, I mean... It's hard, right? Because you want to say, oh, the industry is so small, you're going to run into these people. Well, I guess sort of, you know, with AngelList and everything, the industry has become a little bit bigger. <laughs> but yeah. but still, uh, you know, some of the main influencers, like you don't want to take them off because people still talk amongst their circles. It, it, as much know? as I want to believe that, it's yeah. really interesting because we, we see people have bad reputations. Yeah. Um, I can think of two companies where they had horrible behavior Mm -hmm. in these specific companies, and the two founders in both cases left and started other companies and got venture backed again. Yeah. And I just left everybody in the industry scratching their head saying, who, that person was ousted from their last company for bad behavior, and now you're going to invest, and somebody's investing in them again? Yeah, it makes no sense. And I talked to, in both cases, I had talked to both VCs about it. Just happened to be, and in, in both cases, they said, I think he learned a lot. I think this person has evolved. Yeah. And I was like, in a way, that's nice, but I don't actually buy it. I think it's just greed. Yeah. Oh, I think totally you just great. think this person's a marauding, because in both cases, the the infractions were in the marauding growth space. You'll fill in the blanks mm-hmm. as to who it is. I'll tell you afterwards. Yeah, okay. No anonymize <laughs> the names. Um, when you look at... Um, uh, angel investing, what's your best advice for somebody just starting out? Let's say they're an accredited investor, and we'll end on this. Mm-hmm. They're an accredited investor right now, and we'll do a cr- non-accredited yeah, yeah. next, but we'll talk about accredited. Okay. Maybe they have a net worth of a couple million dollars. What percentage, roughly, if they were going to do this half-time or full-time, let's say they're going to really do it here in the Valley, and they're going to do it for 30 hours a week or 60 hours a week, you know, it's going to be a big portion mm-hmm. of the time. What's your best advice to them for year one, mm-hmm. and maybe what percentage of net worth to deploy, and you know feel comfortable about it? How would you tell them to approach year one of angel investing? So, so now we're talking about accredited. Accredited. This is somebody Investors. with five million, okay. let's say four million dollars in net worth, okay. and they own their home free and clear, and they got a, you know four million dollars in the bank, and they um, mm-hmm. you know they could always go back to work and have a you know half million dollar a year yeah. job here in Silicon Valley because they're a great director of sales or something, right? right? Okay. So they're not hurting for cash. Yeah. They want to do something exciting. Angel mm-hmm. investing appeals to them, and they want to put a certain percentage of their network mm-hmm. worth to work. They're 35 years old, 30 yeah. years old, 40 years old. Yeah. Gosh, it's kind of hard because it's so personal. But I guess right. like in industry terms, you know, I've seen you could probably do about 10%, and you could still, you know, if your home is already paid for and things yeah. like that, you know, then it's almost like, a hobby for you. It's almost yeah. like the equivalent of taking that trip to Las Vegas or, yeah. you know, it's basically money that if you lost it, it wouldn't make a difference in your lifestyle. Right. It wouldn't make you go, oh, I got to move into a smaller home yeah. or I can't go to Hawaii. I've got to go to San Diego yes. for vacation or something. Yeah. Yeah. But then I guess with that, there's sort of discipline, right? Because then you could get either very addicted to it. You sure. want to keep writing checks left and right yeah. <laughs> or, you know, or, or, you know, God forbid you make some wrong investments and you lose all your money, you right. know, which is very typical. I mean, you're How not How would gonna... you, with that 400K, we just pulled out yeah. of the air 10%, and I agree with you. I yeah. always tell people, I think between 1% and 10%, depending yeah. on your... Uh, yeah. your uh, risk tolerance mm-hmm. and when you need the money and how you would feel about losing it would be appropriate yeah. to me. So let's say it's 400K. If they were going to deploy it, how many years and, and how would your broad strokes deploy it? Gosh, broad strokes, I mean... So I'm trying, I'm just thinking, sorry for the silence. I'm trying to think yeah, about think, this. Think it through for a I'm second. Trying to think. I'm, I'm making yeah. you do math in the moment. Not everybody does back of <laughs> no, the envelope no math. Worries. I'm just trying to think, right? I guess what I want to say is like my qualifying statement is that in this particular industry, you might get some returns early on, like I did originally. Remember sure. I invested in company X yeah. and um, I got like 10X in sure. maybe one or two years, but that's kind of an outlier. It's so the industry so. In, in general, it takes roughly 10 years to for get a full, you know, where things are starting to look good, you know, seven to 10 years. Um, Like I said, you might have a few outliers. So I guess going back to your $400,000 example, I mean, maybe for grand, someone wants to try it for four years, you could do 100 grand every year for four, for four years. Um, You know, you could make it last a little bit longer than that, because not, it's almost like, it's not my example, it's sort of an industry example, but you have to treat it as like the wine industry, Mm. certain vintages, right? right? Like, you know, a particular wine now 
2017 may not be as good as an investment, you know, 2020, you know, each year is different for different reasons. So I guess where I'm trying to go with this is that you need enough money or you need enough fortitude or discipline to make that money last over many years, because a lot of these investments aren't going to all hit in year one or year two or year three or year four. Right. Because you might've had that vintage, that was the high valuation year. So maybe you take your time, put... 25k now into what would mm-hmm. be uh, 16 companies over time, right? Uh, and you have a decent chance at uh, portfolio yeah. management and so, a diversification of. So, stuff. for example, I can't predict the future, but I can talk about what's happened in the past. So, we started this in 2007, 2008 time mm-hmm. period. Um, one would argue that was a very crazy time to get into angel investing because um, of the recession, the financial crisis, the financial Great crisis. Yeah. Yep. However, um, we felt that it was the best time to get into it because, because. valuations were low. Ah. Um, you know, we could make a little bit more bets. Our money was going that much farther. And people weren't betting. People were on their heels. And people were on their heels, right. And so now, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. but some of those investments we made back in 2008 have been our best investments. Wow. You know, we got our best return. Me too. Yeah. Congrats. Congrats. <laughs> There's a couple of really good ones in that vintage yeah, thumbtack. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Uber and Wealthfront in that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that great vintage there. Yeah. Uh, it is about vintages. That's a really great yeah. observation. Mm-hmm. You... I can tell just by talking to you, you love what you do, don't yeah. you? Oh, thanks. I absolutely do love it. Every day is an adventure. Some, is it, what do you love about it? Is the adventure? Is it the thrill? Are you a it's, gambler? What is it, the oh, rush? Well, yes, I am actually a gambler, but um, are I, you really? I, do love, I do love to go to Vegas. What do you like? You, were you blackjack? Or I'm you blackjack. Poker? I'm blackjack and uh, Texas Hold'em poker. Oh, you play poker? Me yeah. too. Oh, you do? Oh my God, okay, you have to come cool. play in the home game. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, but uh, so I like to gamble. Uh, not not that I would say venture capital is all about gambling. But it's about risk. But it's about risk. And it's intelligent risk. It's very. It's more analogous, wouldn't you say, to poker, Texas Hold'em poker, than to blackjack? Because blackjack's nothing like poker. Yeah, no, two totally different yeah. animals. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's that, and then it's also, you know, as much as it is uh, science, data, technology, analytics, I love all that. By the mm. way, we're managing XG Ventures all on the back end, sure. using a lot of data. Mm. We're not just doing this willy nilly. I mean, we're capturing a lot of numbers cool. <laughs> behind this. Um, but I think what I like also is the human aspect. As oh. much as it is tech capital, it's also human capital. Right. And I I love that. And maybe that's mm. m- my sales well, background. I think you're an extrovert if you're in sales. Yeah. I would guess that you were oh, uh, an ENTJ. I'm going to yes, take a wild that guess was a here. Good guess. I think I'm going to guess is... you were an ENTJ on the Myers Briggs. As an extrovert yeah. does well in investing. Because you have to meet so many people. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you got to be intro- flexible. Introverts can do very well if they're doing that market analysis and looking yeah. for signal. They can yeah. be very disciplined. So I know some introverted people, I think, who do very yeah. well as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Absolutely. A non-accredited investor is a new discipline that's just started. Yes. I'm sure you've been watching this. Mm-hmm. Um, What's your advice for somebody who might want to dip their toe on Republic, Seed Invest, and some of these crowdfunding sites? I know mm-hmm. that the inventory of startups there is very new and maybe there are people who yeah. they're not the highest quality startups yet mm-hmm. but what are your thoughts on this non-accredited investor starting yeah. to come in through either ICOs or Seed Invest or Republic yeah and think this is exciting are you also talking about AngelList or are you and AngelList too AngelList sure let's say let's say because AngelList will have some accredited investors but yeah. putting in very micro amounts yeah so let's put that all into one bundle you wanted to put $25,000 to work $50,000 to work and right. you make 200000 a year so you could afford to lose mm-hmm. it let's say yeah What's your advice to those people about maybe using that as a segue into maybe eventually becoming a venture capitalist or an angel investor? Yeah, I think, you know. Note, uh, instead of a micro angel. Yeah, sort of like using exactly what you just said, just to reposition that statement. I mean, I think it's um, I think it's a great learning ground. Mm. You know, it's fantastic because you could um, start with smaller bets, mm. right? It's just going back to our Vegas example. You're not going to go into the high roller room, you know, on no your way. first trip to Vegas. No You're probably going to play it like, Bill's casino <laughs> off the strip half, or half something an hour like on the that. Strip where they... <laughs> yeah, you know, you're probably gonna, you know, where your returns are a little. You've got looser slots, or you know, the yep. tables are just, you know, the there's uh, the tables are a little bit looser too. Right. You know, you've got you've you can uh, just have a better experience playing and making your money go farther. I, right. I, I suppose that's probably yeah, you the best can learn. example. I mean, if you're you learning learn. Texas Hold'em at a one two dollar table and you're buying it for forty bucks, what's yeah. the downside? Forty yeah, bucks, there's, yeah, eighty exactly. bucks. But if you're playing at the hundred dollar, two hundred dollar game and buying it for five or ten thousand, you could lose a lot of money real quick. Exactly, and it's not a good experience. You're going to leave feeling very dejected. Uh, you're not going to feel good about yourself. Right. You know, you're going to think, why did I just do that? Very, there's a lot of psychology to what we do, isn't there? There's a lot of psychology. Yeah. So I think going back to your 
original question. I mean, I think it's a great learning ground. And, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, in the tech, tech area, we talk about launching in beta all mm. the time. And I suppose that could be a good analogy for that. Like launch yourself in beta, mm. you know, make those small enough bets, see what you're good at, see the industries um, that maybe you gravitate towards, or perhaps you have the bigger returns in, mm. um, and do some learning, you yeah. know. Take your time. Take your time. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing you might want to keep in mind, though, is too, because you are making smaller bets, your returns might be smaller. Right. So don't think you're going to be able to become a billionaire or yeah. make tens of millions of dollars putting a thousand or two thousand to work. Yeah. But even you know, if you were to return back, uh, you know, and get a hundred x, this could be incredibly meaningful for somebody in their life. Yeah. In that micro, it could be a year salary yeah. or two year salary. That could be enough for you to take a year off from work and become a full time angel. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of my basic theories in life, and one of the reasons I wrote this book was I think people don't take enough intelligent risk, and mm -hmm. in what we do. You, there's so many gains to be had by just learning and being a, surrounded by intelligent people. Mm -hmm. It's almost like what we do. You could, if you paid for it instead of an MBA, you'd be better yeah. off. Like going oh, 250k yeah. in debt for your MBA versus yeah. spending 250k on angel investing, which is a better mm -hmm. investment. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is real life, right? Yeah. It's real life versus. Which one learning. would you learn more at? Definitely real life. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I always liked my professors going, cause, you know, thinking about my time actually getting my MBA. Did you go to Stanford or No, Harvard? I went to Santa Clara University. Oh, Santa Clara. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, a great experience. But I think about it, it was also a different time, right? I got sure. my MBA in 99. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's when I graduated. Well, so this is when it, actually going into business, you needed that MBA. Yeah. It was not possible. Yeah. Um, and it, I didn't mention it, but you are a female, and there are yeah. very few females yeah. in uh, investing. Is it any different being an angel, a female angel investor in your mind? Do you feel you're treated differently or do you feel when you started you might have been treated differently and the industry's changed a bit? It's a big controversial topic yeah. for venture capital. I don't know if it's a controversial topic for angel investors in early stage, yeah. but what are your thoughts on it? I mean, personally, I don't feel like I've been treated any differently, hmm. you know, um, but maybe that's because I came from like the world of sales and, right. you know, I'm just sort of used to more risk taking and doing sure. things that sometimes get you outside of your comfort zone. Okay. Um, but... I, I am aware, of course, that um, there are fewer females in the venture space than um, than males, and there are some challenges because I know Silicon Valley, for example, has gotten a bad rap of having this like, you know, bro culture, sure. tech bros, yeah. venture bros, all that kind of stuff, yeah. where it sort of becomes more of like a fraternity of sorts. Um, however, I think a lot of um, women are making great inroads into the space, you know, sure. just sort of tapping or tipping my hat to some other female investors that I know and I'm friends with, you know, Forerunner Ventures has sure. made um, a great mark into this place um, uh, or it, it has made a great, you know, forward leap into the space, I should say. Yeah. And then... Um, you know, uh, there are some venture partners at uh, other firms that are doing quite well. We talked earlier about Eileen Lee. Yeah, she's got her own firm, she's Cowboy, Ventures. You yeah, have Cowboy Ventures. Now that I think about it, yeah. wow, you were so ahead of the, your time yeah, starting your own firm. Yeah, you thank were, you. You were amongst the first. Yeah, definitely amongst the first. Yeah, but I think you know. What in, about the? Okay, keep I was going. to say, what are, what are the opportunities? Yeah. Um, so, not that we. Uh, every year set out saying, gosh, you know, gosh, this year we're going to invest in like 20% more female, female found founder led companies. It works out that way, kind of, but we don't say that. But I guess what I could say um, more definitively is that, you know, when we are pitched by female investors, um, you know, having me at the table along with my business partner, I think is a good thing mm. um, because, you know, I might think differently than my business partner. And depending on what we're listening to, what the business pitch is, you know, maybe the business pitch is designed to target the female audience. Right. And I might understand that better because I I am a woman right. versus my business partner, who's also very amazing and awesome, happens right. to be male, but you know, he's also very forward thinking and well, you women know. control the majority of this household spending. And yeah. so when you think about how backwards it is that high growth businesses that yep. are targeting consumers, especially in the consumer space, would not have yeah. the female perspective at the table. Yes. It's just mind boggling. It is actually. And yeah. some of our and I have to, you know, give a shout out to this particular company, Third Love is a great example of this. What is this company? Do? Um Third Love has is basically revolutionizing uh, women's uh, bras. They're uh, yeah. taking on the likes of Victoria's Secret. I know and, this company, yeah. Yeah, and they're um, doing quite well and they've um, modeled their business to kind of do some different interesting things. 
things using technology. Um, so they're kind of cool. They're right. very cool. And yeah. um, the founder has uh, been recognized in Forbes magazine, and she's definitely you I've know, heard a lot about it. Yeah, yeah Heidi. Heidi Spector yeah. is her name, and she's fantastic. And it's interesting too because it, when you think about the the male perspective on this, I would never even understand the opportunity. I couldn't yeah. tell you how often women would change their bras or yeah. how many bras they would own on average or when they get when yeah. do you refresh them? I can tell you about men's underwear which is right. weak. <laughs> I'm 46 I just got rid of my college underwear nice it took me about two decades but <laughs> I literally just threw every pair of underwear I've ever owned out <laughs> and bought all new Tommy Johns but that's only because I have a little bit of money right now and I can afford to do it but men <laughs> we hold on so. to those underwear <laughs> until the, the holes in them make them into yeah you know but you know, there's I barely guess, anything left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm continually impressed with her, what she's continued yeah. to do with her company and the product and the product line extension. And to your earlier point, I mean, women control a lot of spending dollars and she's tapped into that. Let me ask you something candidly on the yeah. other side of the table. You haven't felt, I think, discrimination as a female investor. Mm -hmm. Do you think female founders uh, are held to a higher standard of performance by male venture capitalists and investors, um, and has that changed in the last decade of investing that we've both done? Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to say. I wish I had st some statistics off the top of my head to kind of back up that statement. Unfortunately, I don't. But just kind of got going off of anecdotally, I mm. suppose. Um, yeah, that's what I'm looking for is the anecdotal. Yeah, you know, um, I think there are some challenges, you know, but I think as some of the venture firms continue to hire female partners, venture partners, that's going to be a little bit different. Um, and I, I think it's going to be more helpful for these yeah. uh, female founders to get the attention that they need. Um, but we've also seen some female founders excel in this space, yeah. you know, um, and I think that's helped, you know, pave the way. If people can see the role models, they it makes it so much easier models, when you yeah. see Sophia Amoroso or Britton Co. or mm -hmm. Ali Pincus. When you start to see these women building billion dollar companies or hundred million dollar companies and raising $20 million, yep. you're like, hey, there's no reason why a female can't raise 20 million. Yeah, absolutely. I do think they get held to, I've, I've heard from a lot of the female founders I have that they get held to a little bit of a higher standard. Mm -hmm. They have to be that much better to get the same yeah. credit. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do love about investing in female founders is, I, I don't know if you've had this experience, of they take the work more seriously on average than men. Yes. I have found that even with pitching, for example, I've noticed female founders come in um, with more statistics, and I even actually am guilty of it myself, more prepared. right? I just said, I wish I had the statistics and right. things like that. Oh, that's interesting. Whereas uh, men come out more bravado, you right. know? Less like, substance. They, less substance. They, can, they pretend they're credible on things they're not. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen so, that so many times. Yeah. So, and I noticed that when uh, female founders are pitching us, they have like reams and reams of data of the right. market research that they've done. Whereas typically the male counterpart will come in yeah. and they've done zero market research and they just figure, uh, you know, I had a company, I did X before, or mm. I worked at Facebook or I worked at Google. I must be really good at this. Right. You know, and sometimes that's true, but other times, you know, they've done no research, whereas the right. female founder comes in and does more homework, you know? Yeah. I do see that the, the effort put in it, it, specifically, it's yeah. interesting you make this observation, yeah. Andrew, because I've seen it in the, in the pitch meeting meetings, yeah. much more diligence, much more attention to detail, yeah. Yeah. which then gives you a bit of a tell how you do in that pitch meeting. That, that, yeah. That's going to be how you're going to sell in the future. You're going to take yeah. it more seriously. And I'll also say this too. And again, we were kind of joking about Miss Manners before, but I see female founders like really closing that sales loop. You uh -huh. know, not only do I get a nice introductory email telling me about themselves and the right. business and trying to get on my calendar and all that, but equally so the follow-up is there. Right. You know, like, that thank you so much for your meeting. Here's some uh, backup, you know, information. Yeah. Follow you know, up. Follow up. When can I get on calendar to see you next? Yeah, what's your process? What's your process? Yeah, they're a little bit more buttoned up sometimes than yeah. the male counter counterparts. I, you know, and if, what one female founder told me was, Jason, we, we female, she was speaking yeah. for everybody, was yeah. we have to be. Yeah. Because we can't take the risk that you're going to count that against us. We have to be buttoned yeah. up. We have to have it dialed in mm -hmm. because we're not going to be given the benefit of the doubt. And I, I think yeah. there's a little bit of something to that. I do think it's changed dramatically. The number of female founders I'm seeing mm -hmm. has gone way up, just yeah. way up. Yes, definitely. It's fantastic. Yeah. But you know, though, I think it's also because a lot of the, and I'm just kind of using accelerators as an example. Mm. The last couple demo days that I've gone to for Y Combinator of 500 startups, yeah. uh, whether it's, you know, Paul Bukite or, you know, um, 
uh, whoever's, you know, at, yeah, it's a focus. at the lead at uh, Y Combinator at the time, they purposely will come out and say, this is our focus for this quarter. Or, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we are purposely looking at more minority-led companies yeah. or more international companies. There's more intentionality or, of getting more people to apply to these incubators and accelerators. We're, yes. We're very focused on it at launch. We literally yeah. are doing a... We realized we have to put out there in the world that we want Absolutely. this in order to draw people in. Yep. So we said, we're going to create a founder university, which is a two day front yep. for us to get deal flow. It's yeah. literally just a device yep. we created to draw people in. And we said, you know, let's just do one, Jackie, uh, my team and I, and yeah. Ashley. So let's do female founder university. Yep. And it's gonna be 35 female founders only. And since we said, hey, we're doing this, and we put the mm-hmm. intentionality that we're having everybody come together for two days for free to talk mm-hmm. about building your company mm-hmm. better, faster, yeah. more efficiently. Well, now more women are applying because they realize, well, yeah. we care and we want more. Therefore, yeah. they feel, I guess, I, I don't yeah. want to read into it, hey, maybe this is a more friendly place for us, a person who wants to work with more yeah. female founders. So it's yeah. more I definitely applaud you and your group for doing that because yeah. I think it does make a huge difference. You know? yeah. Well, because I, there's, there's always like one or two guys on Twitter or Facebook yeah. who are like, I'm going to the Wonder Woman women-only screening. Right. And they have to like put their yeah. ticket. I don't know if you saw that, where there's a Wonder Woman screening. Right. You're like, I'm so offended that women are going to go see a movie together. That I'm gonna buy a ticket to the women's screening, yeah. tweet it, and then get into arguments with women online. Oh my god, that's ridiculous! And it has to, you know, at the end of the day, this has to be a natural process. I don't feel like it could be so yeah. orchestrated either, yeah. you know, yeah. that it loses its validity. I feel like, right. you know, I mean, yeah. it's good to, to to give that platform and that stage, yeah. you know, that opportunity, but it can't be so calculated either. You don't want little check boxes to say like, "Oh, I'm gonna see Wonder Woman," or I have to, you know. Yeah, there are trigger words in yeah. our society, affirmative action, quotas, all yep. this stuff. And I, you know, the person who had the biggest impact on me was um, the the uh, Mitch and Freda Kapoor. And oh, yeah. Freda oh, was yeah. very inspiring to me saying, hey, Jason, you know, you may not realize it, but kind of a leader in the space, what you yeah. do could actually change things. Do you have a higher yeah. authority? Do you want to see things change? I said, of course I want to see things change. I have three daughters. Well, what yeah. are you doing to change it? Yeah. And that really shook me to my core because it's like, yeah. well, I never saw myself as being responsible for mm-hmm. maybe changing the ratio or having any part in that. My job mm-hmm. is to just find the best company to invest. Mm-hmm. But it, it, she really afraid to, uh, you know, have to give yeah. her credit for getting inside my head. Yeah, because I, I was see just that. like, huh, yeah. what am I doing? Am yeah. I am I actively doing something? And so my team and I had a heart to heart about how how can we mm-hmm. be a positive force in yeah. the world? Right, positive influence. Right, you know, and through leadership, basically, right. and just, which is what you're doing. If you put more. F- if you if you if you know where the female founders are, or the female investors are, you know, and part of having you on this yeah. program is, you, oh, you don't you never you never speak it. You're always yeah. so busy working. I, <laughs> you're so busy working, and I told you before we start the program, I really need you to come to more events. Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> sign me up. I have ten years of investing, yeah, starting your own fo- firm before yeah. any. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing what you've done. You've started this hundred hundred significant investments, yeah. and you started a female led fund. 10 years ago and this whole and we're brou- still going and we're still going but the whole brouhaha of f- females in investing yeah. started five or six years ago you yeah. were five years ago you had started one yeah it's incredible yeah. Oh, listen continued success Andrea yeah, and if you. you are interested absolutely in pitching her xg-ventures xg-ventures and uh, you can go take a look at her angel list profile if you go to angel.co slash Andrea Zurich Z-U-R-E-K like the city Pronounce like the city spells slightly different. Yes. <laughs> Zurich. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks you so much for doing it. And we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.